You're listening to Simple Ritz Radio, episode number 123, and today we're talking about the immune system and how to boost it for cold and flu season. Welcome to Simple Ritz Radio with Alexa Sherm. Alexa believes that simplicity in life is the key to achieving true and lasting health. And now your host, Alexa Sherm. Welcome back to this podcast. As always, my name's Alexa, and this is the place to get healthy, live happy, and find more joy Today, we're talking all about the immune system. In fact, we're taking a little bit of a deeper dive into the immune system, specifically how it works to keep you well and how we can help it work to keep us well. We're diving into all the specifics because, like always, I believe that if we just provide the right environment for our body to do the job that it was designed, it will do it far better than we could ever try doing for it. It really is a fascinating subject, and I hope that you love it as much as I do. Now, here's the thing about the immune system. Next to the nervous system, it has to be one of the most complex organ systems there is. In fact, I would say that we know fairly little about the immune system, but what we do know is really powerful. And that's what we're going to dive in on today's episode. In the next episode, I'll be sharing a little bonus episode on why you need to stop using hand sanitizer, like for real. And I know that sounds crazy, and there are a lot of people who love their hand sanitizer. Stay tuned for that special bonus episode, which will make more sense once you understand how the immune system works. But before we get there, I just want to remind you that all of the notes from today's show can be found at simpleartswellness.com backslash one, two, three, plus I share some additional ways to rev your immune system all year long. And while you're over there, make sure you hop on the email list where I share a weekly email slash newsletter with more information and tips and tricks and hacks, recipes, anything you can imagine on how to live a better life. Plus, I'm going to be giving you some updates on what's happening coming the new year. I can't wait for you to hear about it. Again, all those details get released next week, so stay tuned for that. But make sure you get on the email list so you have first access and priority to what's coming. So again, head on over to the show notes, simpleartswellness.com backslash one, two, three to get all that. Also, don't forget the 2019 planners are here. They're shipping. And that's one tool that we're going to be needing for the new year surprise, right? Whatever is coming. I know I'm super vague about this and you're probably tired of me not telling you what it is, but telling you that you need a nurse planner. Even if you're not going to join me January 1st, you also should just check out the nurse planner because I feel like it's one of the best tools to helping to break down your life and schedule health into your life. Because we know that some of the hardest things to do is actually make health a priority. And the best way you can do that is just transition your daily rhythms and your daily routines to make health a part of it. So to find out more about the Nourish Planner, head on over to nourishplanner.com. Okay, now let's get started right away. Today, we're digging into the immune system. So what is the immune system? I mean, I think we all know what the immune system is, right? It protects the body like a guardian from all these harmful substances from the environment. It is critical to survival. In fact, we can't live very long at all without the proper immune system because there's so many, so many invaders inside of our body that it will start decaying almost immediately. So we have to have a good functioning immune system. And really, when I look at health and the scope of health, I think we are so focused on metabolism and all these other things. And I feel like we just hear such little about the immune system. But I'm wondering, what would change if we put more emphasis on supporting the immune system? Like, could we overcome allergies? Could we overcome a lot of autoimmunity and cancers, all these diseases? Like, if our immune system was well-functioning and well-oiled to a place where we didn't even notice it, like, that's the place of health, right? Where we don't even notice our immune system working. Could we then beat so many of these diseases that we're plagued with? Like, I really think that there is something critical about the immune system that we're missing. And so we're going to dive into this a little bit. But like I said, as long as our body's defense systems are working, I mean, you rarely notice it, right? Like, you don't notice all the bacteria and viruses that your body is fighting off. We don't notice the cancer that our body is fighting off, right? All we notice is when we get symptoms, and the symptoms is when it's become too aggressive for our immune system to handle for some reason or another, which we're going to talk about those reasons. But like I said, the only time that we notice our immune system is when it's compromised or there's an especially aggressive pathogen. That's where we experience problems, and it's probably that you get sick, you get a symptom, you get a fever, all these other signs that are quote-unquote annoying to you or painful or irritating, right? That's when we notice our immune system. But outside of that, we don't know that it's working 24 hours a day 
to keep your body well. Now, here's the thing about the immune system. It's not just little cells that are going around your body, right? It's a whole host of organ systems, cells, hormones, and even proteins. Like, it's a full body scope. And we have points of our immune system all over. Even on the outside of our body, on our skin, we have a very protective layer of skin that is our immune system. But also, we're going to be talking about some of these other hormones and oils and secretions that our body has to protect us. But before we get there, we have to understand how the immune system works. There's one critical component to our immune system that is vital in survival, and that is the ability to differentiate. So our immune system has the ability to differentiate between quote-unquote self and quote-unquote non-self organisms and substances. This is just a means of preventing the body from working against its own healthy cells. So your immune system has the ability to tell if that's your actual cell or an invader. And that's really, really critical. And one of the stumbling blocks we have in an autoimmunity is why then is our body attacking itself, right? When we look at autoimmunity, that's an immune response against self. And so for us to understand autoimmunity, we have to understand why is our own immune system attacking itself when technically our immune system is really complex enough to understand what is self and what is non-self. We'll dive into this a little bit more, but that's one of the really awesome things that our body can do is it can differentiate between itself and between whatever is coming in as an invader. So how does the immune system get activated? The immune system can be activated by many non-self substances, which are called antigens, or proteins on the surface of bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, all these things, right, that are invaders in our body can trigger the immune system based on the antigen or on the protein on the outside of it. So when these antigens bind to special receptors on these defense cells, A series of cell processes is started, which allows the immune system to recall stored memories. So basically, all these viruses and bacteria have these little proteins on the surface of them, and the immune system is going to respond to that by attaching a defense cell. And the defense cell is going to read that protein and determine, is this something that I have a memory to? Basically, is this something that I've already come in contact with and my immune system has been able to beat? What's fascinating about this is that our body will store every single pathogen, virus, bacteria that it comes in contact with and be more ready to defend against these pathogens. This is why in some cases, like chicken pox, where they say you can only get it once, it's because your body has great memory to those things and will just kill it on defense before it has time to get too aggressive. Now, why do we get these viruses in the beginning? When we don't have a stored memory to those viruses or pathogens, it takes a little bit longer to activate and trigger that. And by the time that happens, there are some cases where it becomes too aggressive, right? Where it takes over quicker than the immune system can respond to it. That's why in stored memories, if we have these stored memories, that our body will respond to them quicker and eliminate them quicker. So it all has to do with the full working of the immune system. Now, what we know is that the more that we look at the immune system as a whole, as a hormone system, as uh, secretions and bodily fluids and We just take care of our system and our liver and our kidneys and all the all the dumping points in our body, then we know that our immune system can react to things that it doesn't have stored memory to quicker than someone who doesn't. So for instance, the more your body's bogged down, the more stress it is, the slower the reaction time to foreign invaders is gonna be. And if you don't have a stored memory, probably the more likely you are to get the common cold, to get stomach bugs and all the things. So that's one reason we want to have a good functioning immune system. Another little key point that we're going to talk about in the little bonus episode is that there is some strong basis that in order to have a stronger immune system, we have to allow our bodies to be exposed to germs. (laughs) Much against what people want to believe is to sterilize everything, right? There is some true power in letting kids get sick and letting kids play in the dirt and letting our bodies come in contact with other things. Like they say, the more a kid gets infected with a common cold, actually the stronger the immune system is going to develop. And it has to do with all these stored memories, right? If our kids are never getting sick, then when they get to be an adult and their immune system is much slower, it is going to have a greater impact on them overall. So there is some parts of that which we're going to talk about in the bonus episode. So again, it's these antigens that react to the defense cells that tell our immune system what to do with it. And there are two main parts of the immune system. One is the innate and the other is the adaptive. 
So the innate immune response, which is often referred to as the nonspecific immune system, works mostly at the level of immune cells like scavenger cells and killer cells. I would really describe the innate immune response as more of the repair and restore that's happening all the time, right? Like these aren't necessarily like big pathogens that are coming in to really make you sick, but this is just continual repair and restoration, maybe to helping to get rid of cancer cells before they turn into a diagnosable cancer. That's what the innate immune system is. The adaptive is specific to antibodies to target specific pathogens that the body has already come in contact with. So this is more of the stored memories. This is more of like the invaders that are coming in. Now, they don't work independently of each other. Like they really do complement each other in a lot of reactions to pathogens or harmful substances. Like For instance, a mosquito bite that gets red and itchy, right? You're sending out both the adaptive and the innate immune response. They're just working differently. And that's why it gets red and itchy. The same with the cold and flu, why why you get fevers and why you get chills and night sweats. Like that's all a part of your immune system working to fight that off. We look at a fever as a bad thing, but that's actually a response in your immune system to help kill off what it's having trouble doing. So all of these things like swollen ankle, when you sprain your ankle, that's a part of an immune response to help protect your body. It's when these things get out of control that our body needs a little extra help, but just the red itchy of a mosquito bite, that's your body healing itself. So all these things are really good in the small term and how they're supposed to work. It's when it gets out of control that that's obviously when we need some additional help. But if your body is working to get rid of these signs, it's a good sign that it's adapting. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad when you get a fever, it's bad when you get a headache or when you vomit, right? Like all these things sound bad and we don't like them, but if we get through them, it's a really great sign that your body is working really well, that it's adapted to viruses and illness, making your immune system stronger. It's when you can't get rid of them. You have the persistent cold that never goes away. That's when you recognize your body has a problem, like when you're constantly sick or are getting sick more often than the average human. Now, kids are a little different because on average, kids really should get seven to 10 colds a year, um, especially before the age of three or five. And that's really healthy and helping their immune system to respond. But again, it's the kids who can't get over strep throat. It's the kids who can't get over ear infections. Like that's where we're, uh, where we're trying to understand why is their immune system not responding as well as it should be. So the job of your immune system is to protect your body from foreign invaders, and it does this in three big ways. One, it creates a barrier that prevents bacteria and viruses from entering your body. There's lots of barriers, and we're going to talk about those in a second. The second thing, though, it does is if it does get in, it detects and eliminates itself before it can make itself at home and reproduce. So as soon as a foreign invader gets in, your body sends those defense cells to detect what it is, and then send out the right immune response based on what it's determined it is. But if the virus or bacteria produces and starts causing problems, a bigger attack goes out and your immune system will get rid of it. So most of the time when we have foreign invaders come in, right, we don't even know this is happening. So your foreign invader gets in your body, your defense cells detect it, and it gets rid of it. The problem when it reproduces and kind of goes crazy inside your body is that's when we start to get fever and the cold symptoms and all the things that we don't love. And that's when we know it's kind of gotten out of control, but your body should still be able to get rid of it, to kill it, and get back to normal. And I have eight principles of helping your body to do that so that it can get the job done. So that's kind of the three ways your body works. And even inside the body, right? Like when we have cancer cells or or cells that are going wrong inside the body, it does the same thing. It detects that there is a problem, it encapsulates it, and then it gets rid of it. That's why many cancers are encapsulated. And this is just a side note. And one of the reasons that there is some research going on about going in and doing biopsies, like are biopsies actually causing cancers to spread that otherwise would have your body would have taken care of itself? Because once we split the capsule that your body has encapsulated it with, then those cells can get out. But if we just let our body do the job that it's trying to do by forming this capsule around these cancer or these bad cells and hopefully eventually getting rid of them on their own when it has the time and the space to do so in the right environment, rather than us going in and breaking that open, taking a biopsy and allowing all those bad cells to then spread throughout the body. I mean, it's really fascinating stuff. It's definitely worth listening to, especially if someone tells you to do a biopsy on something. I mean, in some cases, of course, it's not cancer and it does no harm. But in other cases, if it is cancer, is that doing more harm than good? 
Anyways, something to worth researching about. Maybe we'll talk about it later on. But your body does encapsulate these bad things in order to get rid of them. It's part of the process. Okay, so what are the parts of the immune system? Of course, there's so many things going on, but we're just going to start on the outside. The skin. This is the primary defense organ against illness. And I think we don't often look at our skin as an organ, but it is our largest organ and really one of the most efficient organ systems that we have. So the skin is tough. It's generally impermeable to bacteria and viruses. In fact, our skin contains these special cells that are an important early warning sign to the immune system. So like there's cells on the outside of our skin that will signal the inside of our immune system that we're in, we're in contact with a lot of foreign invaders. We're in contact with a lot of virus and bacteria and fungi that need attention. So it alerts the system to be on guard. But also our skin is secreting antibacterial substances, which kill most of what's actually landing on your skin very quickly. So not only do we have cells on our skin that are communicating with the inside of our body, but we also secrete in our oils, uh, antibacterial. And that is to work to, to fight off these foreign invaders. Again, giving you clues at why antibacterials are actually doing more harm than good. Then we also have our nose and our mouth and our eyes, which outside of the skin are the best way for viruses and bacteria to get inside your body. And all of these things contain their own source of antibacterial. So our saliva has antibacterial properties. The the mucus inside of our nose and our eyes all contain antibacterial properties to them that help kill bacteria and viruses in different ways. Our saliva and our mucus in our nose and even in our eyes helps to trap the bacteria and then expel it. I know like, for instance, like pink eye, right? You get all those crusty things coming out of your eye, eye goop, right? That's your body kind of encapsulating that or strangling it, (laughs) smothering it in the mucus and then expelling it outside the body. The same thing happens with our nose. Why we need to blow our nose and get rid of the snot is that it's encapsulated or that it's smothered all these viruses and bacteria and our body just needs to get rid of them. So it's important And one of the things about seasonality, especially going into winter, is that we know that it's a dry season. So we know our eyes can dry out, our mouth can dry out, and our nose can dry out. So one quick tip that we're going to talk about later on is to keep all of those cavities moist can be really, really powerful in helping our body to fight off. Because a lot of times these viruses, like the the flu virus, right, or a common cold, that's in the air. That's a respiratory thing, right? That we're breathing in. Um, Sometimes we're consuming with food and other things, but a lot of those are just airborne. And so one thing is, is if we don't have enough normal mucus or enough moisture inside our cavities, like our, our nose and our eyes, then will we not be able to smother the viruses and bacteria? And then they have a more likely chance to get in the body. So those are our first lines of defense. Of course, if it goes through your mouth, it then has to pass through the stomach acid and the intestines. So the better your digestive system is working and the better your gut microbiome is, of course, the better your immune system is going to be. But once inside the body, then it's going to affect the thymus, the spleen, the lymph system, bone marrow, white blood cells, antibodies, hormones like your lymphokines and other hormones like steroids and corticosteroid, which suppress the immune system, which is also why stress suppresses the immune system, because we have a lot of those corticosteroids that are released in response to stress. So that's why stress is such a huge deal. So those are some of the things that are affecting our body and really the basis about how our immune system works, right? So I hope we're kind of getting the big picture about our immune system before we start talking about how we can fix it. And I give eight tips to helping your body eliminate and get rid of viruses and bacteria. But before we get there, I think it's also interesting to know that some viruses and bacteria are actually really beneficial. And I bring this up because I think we have such a huge fear of all germs that we don't realize that it's all about the balance. Just like our gut microbiome, right? We have really good bacteria in our gut that's so beneficial, and we also have bad. But if we can keep a good balance of the healthy stuff inside our body, it can really help ward off the bad. That's why like antibiotics, when we take them and when we look at our gut microbiome, it doesn't just kill the bad bacteria, it kills all of the bacteria. And when we eliminate the good, then we're left with more problems in the beginning. So there are good viruses and bacteria. In fact, 
Scientists have known for quite some time that there are an array of microorganisms, like including viruses and fungi, protozoa, and even some worms, that have adapted to the human biology in a harmless way, in some cases even um, beneficial. So I have a few studies here that I think is really beneficial. So one, there's a researcher from Pennsylvania State University, Dr. Marilyn Rusnik, and she published a piece that found that we have a population of viruses in the gut, the skin, and even the blood that are really beneficial. In fact, she states that they've known this well over 40 years and that this viral collection has its own name to counter the bacterial-centric focus of the microbiome, and it's called the viome. So not only do we have the microbiome or bacteria that's healthy and living on our skin and our hair in our GI tract, but we also have a virus-centric organisms living on our skin, in our gut, in our blood that's called the virome. And what they found is that the virome appears at a very young age and appears to be dynamic in the first few months of life. Each has a collection of viruses that there are some specific to us all, but again, these are all unique to us. And what these viruses do is they target bad bacteria to help get rid of it. So not only is your good bacteria working, but also your good healthy virome. I think that's really interesting. Another thing that we have is that there's studies showing how viruses can be a great treatment option to fight cancer. And I know this sounds bizarre, but I listened to an entire podcast on this and then went back and studied some things. But basically what they found is that since the late 1800s, doctors have observed that some cancer patients with a viral infection have made their cancer go into remission, even though it was temporary at the time, right? But what they did know is that For some reason, viruses would make cancer go into remission. It would make it disappear, at least for the time being. But up until recently, the relationship seems counterintuitive, so we haven't really studied it. But recently, research is starting to take a look at this, and they're studying several dozen viruses to learn how they may use to shrink or destroy tumor cells, which also triggered the immune system to attack cancer. Now, there's a doctor, Dr. Alan Tan, who states, Virus therapy, as is often referred to in medical community, is not recognized as a kind of immunotherapy, and the excitement around this form of treatment stems largely from its perceived ability to turn on the immune system and to fight cancer. So basically, when certain viruses like chickenpox, smallpox, HPV are modified and injected into a tumor cell, what happens is they make copies of themselves, which eventually causes the cell to burst. So what they're doing is they're injecting these into the specific cancer cells, allowing these things to grow and reproduce very rapidly, which cause the cell to burst. Not only does that kill the cancer cell itself, but the dying cell also releases a substance such as tumor antigens that allow the immune system to recognize that type of cell as foreign, prompting an attack. So what happens, we know, is when cells burst inside the body, it sends out a signal to the immune system to come and fight that off, to come and get rid of it, package it up, and to classify it as a bad cell. So again, if we can get our immune system to recognize bad cells like cancer can then, you know, these cells that we've burst and we've shown our body, can your immune system then go back in its stored memory and attack all the cells that are like it? Like some would say a lot of cancer that gets out of control are just tumors that are sort of hiding out from your immune system. For some reason, your body hasn't recognized them as bad and therefore it's left alone. So Really, the idea with this virus therapy is to get your immune system working and revving and to recognize these cells as bad. And then together, this huge immune response goes out and your body is able to then beat cancer. Now, there's a doctor who is beating cancer in dogs using this therapy. Of course, it's not... um, It's not approved yet for cancer therapies here in America. Overseas, they're starting to use this a lot. And there is a doctor or researcher who's doing a lot of cancer therapy on pets and finding huge, huge benefits. What's even more interesting is that they're able to create their own viruses and they're computerizing it. Like, I mean, it's so simple for them to create these viruses, inject them in the cancer cells and create this immune response where your body actually kills it because they know that having your body do what it's supposed to do is way more effective than us trying to go in and write, like use radiation or chemotherapy to kill it. Because we can only find the cancer at the level of what we can see, right? At the cellular level, a lot of things are going on that your immune system is way more effective at dealing with. 
So anyways, that's a side note, but I think it's so fascinating to see how we can use viruses for a lot of good. They're not just stuff to fear. So at the end of the day, what we know is it's not just about getting rid of viruses and creating a sterile environment. In fact, that's really harmful for our body. What we need to know is how we can support the immune system to provide what it needs to do the job that it was designed. And so what can we do for these things? What do we know works? So whether you're preventative or whether you're coming down with something, it's really important to not just do something for your body, but to give the space and time for your body to do the job that it was designed. So up first is sleep, rest and sleep. I can't express this enough. If you wanna stay healthy, we have to rest and sleep more. I mean, sleep studies are coming out that people who get less than five hours of sleep a night are just literally killing their bodies from the inside out. So sleep is so important in healing your body and restoring it. So we have to get more sleep. So if you're coming down with something, try to get an extra 30 minutes or an hour a night. Maybe skip your workout, right? Like give your body space to rest. The second thing is, is learning to de-stress your body or to learn techniques to de-stress, whether it's taking a hot bath, whether it's taking a break from work, getting off social media, reading a good book, you know, slowing down your life a little bit because we know that one of the worst things that you can do for your immune system is stress because it releases corticosteroids, which decrease the effectiveness of your immune system. So try to de-stress. Next to sleep is probably one of the biggest killers of our body, and maybe stress is the reason you aren't sleeping. It doesn't mean that we're going to eliminate all stress, but we have to learn ways to manage stress. So that's number two. Number three is to oxygenate your cells. A lot of us under stress and without enough sleep actually aren't taking deep enough breaths to fully oxygenate every single cell in our body. And we know oxygen helps kill viruses and bacteria. It helps our immune system work, but it also creates a a bad environment for these things to grow. A lot of viruses and bacteria don't like the oxygen levels of our body and can't reproduce. However, without enough oxygen, our our body's pH is different and just the inside workings of our body are different. So taking some deep breaths can help oxygenate your body. But what I mean by that are like belly breaths. So breathing through your nose, counting in for four, like pushing your belly out, and then pulling your belly in to release that air. Those are deep breaths. It's not chest breathing like so many of us do where our stomach doesn't move and our chest cavity just moves. Those aren't deep breaths. What we're talking about, deep oxygenating breaths, are where we move our belly, where we expand our belly out and then pull it back in and count four in and then four out and repeat that 10 times. You can do that at stoplights. You can do that throughout the day. It's a great point of when you realize your body is so stressed or you're not feeling well to just try and take some really deep breaths can really make a huge difference. Number four is seasonality. Stay warm, right? Go back and listen to the podcast on seasonality. It is going to be huge, but staying warm can really prevent that. And you've heard this forever, right? Cover your ears. You're going to catch a cold. Does that really matter? Okay, so I did a little research on this. Again, a quick side note. But what they found is that warmer body temperatures appear to help prevent the cold virus from spreading in multiple ways. And this is from Yale University. And the team found that cells produce essential immune system protein called interferons that respond to the cold virus. But the cells were infected with a virus in a lab. So what they found, how they determined the temperature though, is that they infected the cells with a virus in a lab and incubated at either a core body temperature of 98.6 degrees or a cooler temperature of 91.4 degrees. And what they found is that the infected cells exposed at a healthy body temperature, the virus died off more quickly and wasn't able to replicate, unlike at the cooler body temperature. So the cooler your body, what they're finding is the faster viruses can replicate and the longer they can live. So cold weather and respiratory disease like the flu go hand in hand and where the viruses are actually thriving in the colder temperatures. So one great way to prevent colds and flus is to warm your body up and to warm it up daily. So whether again, the sauna, like I mentioned last week, can be such a huge tool in keeping your body well because it increases your core body temperature, taking hot baths, exercising, moving your body, um, drinking hot teas, sticking to warmer foods in the cooler months, those can all be great ways to warm it up. So focus on seasonality. Again, trying to provide what your body needs in the season. The fourth thing is movement. We didn't really talk specifically about this, but how your body, once your body encapsulates 
and destroys these immune cells, your body then has to get rid of them, right? And the best way to get rid of them is through your urine or your feces or your sweat. And so this all has to be done through the lymphatic system. Your lymphatic system is runs opposite of your blood, and it's what takes the debris and the toxins outside of your body. It, like, it removes them from your blood and helps your body detoxify them. But here's the thing about the lymphatic system is that your lymph system doesn't have a central pump. There's no pump like your heart that pumps this fluid through. So in order for your body to move your lymphatic fluid, you have to move it for it. One of the best ways to do that is through movement. So moving your body more, walking, sweating. Again, even if you don't want to move your body, sitting in a sauna will help move your lymphatic fluid because you're sweating um, and contracting your muscles. Also, you could use a foam roller or one of the reasons I really like dry brushing is because it can move your lymphatic fluid. So movement, move your lymphatic fluid. Number six is supplements and herbs. I'm not going to dig into this a ton here, but I will be sharing those over in the show notes. Some of my favorite supplements and herbs to use when you feel like you're coming down to something or to prevent it. We know, again, one of the greatest problems with our immune system is not having the nutrient foundation to actually work well. And our immune system requires a lot of nutrients. Again, it's not just a a system of cells, right? It's hormones and it's organs and other things. And so nutrient deficiencies can cause a lot of immune issues. So providing the right nutrients can also help your immune system to work well. So I'm going to link up all those supplements and herbs over in the show notes, but some great ones are like zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C are all huge. And then you can get in some herbs like um, oil of oregano, echinacea. Those things can be really powerful. Number seven is to stay hydrated. Again, we have to have the right concentration of fluid working through our body. And the more dry our body is, the more likely viruses are to enter and to spread and replicate. Moisture is a great way for our body to kill that and to create an environment where it's not conducive to replicating and surviving. So staying well hydrated, drinking warm lemon water in the morning, sipping hot teas, making sure that you have plenty of electrolytes in your life can all be really beneficial. And number eight is to stop feeding viruses. There are a lot of foods that actually viruses love and there are a lot of foods viruses hate. So the foods that viruses love are dairy products eggs, and even chicken. And I know that sounds crazy, but those tend to be foods that your viruses, that viruses love to consume. And of course, sugar, right? But if we start feeding in other things like antivirals, like honey and fresh fruits and vegetables, I mean, even cooked, right? Like all of those things, healthy sources of protein, like beef and um, beans, all of those things can be great sources. And of course, eliminating inflammatory causing foods or foods that you're sensitive to. So those are the top eight ways to help your immune system out. Those are the things that your body can really use. It's not just coming in with cold medicine or um, all the time with these anti-inflammatory medications, right? Like, yes, there is a time and a place that we may need those, but it's best not to create that immunity to those things and really just create the space and the environment your body needs to thrive. So again, using These practices, which include rest and sleep, de-stressing, oxygenation, seasonality, movement, supplements and herbs, staying hydrated, and stop feeding the viruses to do great things. Okay, over in the show notes, I'm going to list my favorite supplements and herbs that I use to help feed that, and then I'm going to just give a little thing about stop feeding your viruses. I'm going to do another podcast later on about how we feed viruses and how we can stop doing that. And I'm going to relate it more to my Lyme diagnosis and what I'm learning based on that. But again, to get all the information on today's show, head on over to the simperitswellness.com backslash one, two, three to get that information. Okay, that is all I'm going to be sharing today in the immune system. I know it's a lot. Sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose, but I hope that you found it beneficial and informative. I hope that you can take this information and use it during the holidays and this winter to help ward off colds and flus. And remember, it's not the fear of getting them. It's just about how fast you can get over them because some colds and flus are necessary to help support and strengthen the immune system, but we just don't want them to linger. So use these practices this year to help give your body the space it needs to do the job that it was meant to do. And I can assure you, you will feel better than ever. So use these. Let me know what you think. Make sure you follow me at Alexa Sherm on Instagram or at Sunports Wellness 
on Facebook where I'll be sharing more insight into my daily routine to help overcome colds and flus and to prevent it. And also, don't forget to head on over to the show notes to get more information on today's show and those supplements and herbs that I'm using. You can do that at simperitswellness.com backslash one, two, three. Also, I would love it if you would share this episode with your friends. If you loved it, if you found it beneficial, shoot them a quick email or share it on Instagram and Facebook. You never know who would want to join the community of like-minded people who are on a mission to just live a healthier life in a realistic way. Like, end the rules and let's just understand how we can feed our body in the way that it needs to be fed. Okay, that's it for now. Don't forget to share that. Tag me if you do share it. I would love to see that as well. In the meantime, I will be back on Friday with all the reasons why you should stop using hand sanitizer. Until then, I hope you have a great rest of the week.